Oh, yeah. Good, mor good morning, everyone. Zach, how am I doing? There it is. Yeah, yeah. So welcome back after a week off or a, a week in under the tent. It's good to have everyone back. My name is Darren Collins. I'm the president of COA and an alum from the class of 92, which I'm excited about. And the greatest thing about being president is I get to kind of live vicariously through other alums. And, you know, when I was a student here, I always wanted to be this guy, Greg Stone. And Greg was like an underwater explorer who spent more time under the ocean than above the ocean. But since I've been back as president, um, I've wanted to be Chase Morrill, right? Um, and so I'm super excited that, that he's here. Um, uh, partially it's because of the beard and the hair and like living, you know, I'm missing, missing that, but really more than anything else, it's his, his job. Like, I think the idea of imagining a future for a structure and seeing a project through from that idea to reality is a really important process. So much of academia, um, intellectually at least tends to be deconstructing things. And I love that Chase and his work, not only intellectually, but also materially, is, is building. And I think that's really, really important. It's something we want to imbue across every student here. I'm also excited because Heather Lakey is going to be introducing Chase. And Heather is the faculty in philosophy here at, at the, uh, the College of the Atlantic. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. We can get, we can get that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so, yes, there will be philosophizing up here, <laughs> but um, it's also because they were classmates um, from both from the class of 2000. And so we thought that would be a really nice pairing. And in fact, I understand there are like six members of the class of 2000 here. Woo! Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Sean Keeley, Zach Soares are also um, members of that class. So Heather, Heather Lakey did her bachelor's degree here. She did her master's degree here. She did uh, a master's in, in, sorry, philosophy at the University of Oregon, and then did uh, her PhD back at the University of Maine here. She's an ethicist, a bioethicist, studies women and gender and philosophy and is just a remarkable human being and an incredible teacher and so a great pairing welcome chase and heather we both yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm clapping for you <laughs> thank you howdy <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Test, test. Okay. Well, welcome back to campus, Chase. Wonderful to have you here. 
Um, so I have the privilege of getting to introduce Chase, who is a man of many talents, uh, <laughs> but arguably probably most famous for the reality TV series. Anyone know the name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he's also a skilled carpenter. He owns the construction company, Kennebec Property Services, which he took over from his father. Uh, along with some other cabin masters, he started the retail store, the Kennebec Cabin Company, in 2020, which is in Manchester, Maine. There is a restaurant called The Woodshed. Yep. And what do you sell at The Woodshed? Beer and wine. Very good. And, and, and sandwiches. <laughs> and sandwiches. Get <laughs> <laughs> <Is> that clear. <laughs> uh, hosts a podcast titled From the Woodshed with his brother-in-law, Ryan, and daughter, Maggie. And then, as Darren said, importantly, uh, Chase is a COA graduate. So Most importantly. <laughs> very credentialed. <laughs> And I just want to say, you know, full disclosure, I don't know very much about reality TV, although I do spend time thinking about reality. Um, <laughs> where I don't know much about the construction or renovation of cabins, but I have known, as uh, Darren was saying, I've known Chase for decades. And over the last few years, just because of the pandemic and other life experiences, we haven't had much time to talk. So I'm really excited yeah. to have this hour to chat with Chase again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So yeah, it's great to be back on campus. It's been a few years, but it's as beautiful as I remember it. That's yeah. for sure. So I was thinking we could start off by just like reminiscing then a little bit about COA and in the short amount of time, <clears throat> excuse me, you've been here back um, this morning. Is there anything different that you notice? Things that are the same? Um, I'd say we're sitting in the biggest one probably <laughs> yeah. um, and the beautiful mural over there. I started out in CFOX my freshman year. I was an RA in CFOX my second year and then yeah, lived around Bar Harbor, Just worked up here in the summertime. So it yeah, it's definitely a change. A lot more people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one thing I always tell um, prospective students who are interested in the college that, you know, I try to stress this fact that there's a very sort of wildly independent element about the COA experience because everyone designs their own degree in human ecology. And I'm just curious, did you have a specific focus <laughs> during your time here at the college or were there particular learning experiences? While you were at COA that informed what you're doing now? Um, I didn't. Did you? Have a focus? Yeah. Well, I came here to study. <laughs> <laughs> were we supposed to? <laughs> <laughs> I think like many, I came here thinking I was going to study whales, but yeah. ended up in philosophy. Oh. So <laughs> Yeah, so I when I put when I had a resume, I put on my resume that I got a BA BA? Yeah, okay. In human <laughs> ecology with a Focus in Asian and chemistry studies. Really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that was because I had taken a trip to China during school and then I took a few chemistry courses and enjoyed it. So, yeah. That's... <laughs> and look at me now. So, yeah. My brother in law, Ryan, has a English teaching degree from UMF. Mm -hmm. uh, Dixie, who also works with us, has a degree in, I think, Ski resort management from right. Orno as well. And my sister has a graphics art design degree from Univis USM. So, you know, I mean, we kind of just end up wherever. Yeah. I think one of my big influences here was probably, um, I want to say Miller Doherty, you know, working for buildings and grounds. One of my first jobs ever, I don't, uh, yeah, I'll tell it, whatever. Um, <laughs> one of my first jobs ever was that old Riles building, there was an old septic pipe that ran out into, it was an overflow pipe that ran out into the ocean. And, you know, you'd get heavy rains and stuff, it just had to go somewhere. And so me and this other freshman, Bo Whitka, oh. had to go out there and the pipe had cracked and we had to put the pipe back together there was water rushing through it and you know it had a little bit of everything in it and you know I've, it was fine with me you know i've done that before i was like all right but Bowick was from california and he was just horrified <laughs> but i think at that point i learned two lessons the most important one is that runs downhill <laughs> <laughs> you always want it going downhill and the lowest man gets the dirty job, so. <laughs> yeah, but they fixed that pipe. It doesn't go into the bay anymore, so. Well done. Yeah, yeah. But yes, Miller Doherty, you know, he was a huge influence. And I did a lot of, you know, kind of building work around here. Was that your work study? Did you have work study? That was my work study. Yeah. Um, 
part of the moving to the Natural History Museum. I think that happened when we were here, you know, emptying that place out. Mm -hmm. I was doing recycling a lot, so reusing stuff. Now, can you talk a little bit about your senior project? Because if I remember correctly, yes. I think that has some clear connections with the work you're doing on main cabin masters. Yeah, so my senior project was to renovate the Rath Scaler, which was an old part of the Riles building. And at that time, the, I, I think, was turrets being renovated? I don't I know. think turrets or one of the buildings was being renovated and they had to move part of the admissions office into the existing student lounge. So we needed a new student lounge. So I went in and renovated, you know, got work crews in there to renovate and we, you know, made this student lounge space usable for us. And yeah, unfortunately, that's no longer standing today. <laughs> Not because of my craftsmanship. <laughs> it just didn't fit. And but I was able to salvage some of the old doors and windows that are actually in my kids rooms today. So oh, great. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think with the show, it's it's a great opportunity for us to kind of showcase that you can reuse, you know, material because my father, I'm all over the place right now. That's my okay. father was always doing that when we were little, you know, he'd go out. He was picking up material, old barn boards, whatever, and making furniture long before it was kind of trendy. And, you know, we grew up helping him and stuff like that. So I think I learned a lot from him as well. Yep. And, you know, it was fun to kind of continue that along without really knowing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, maybe this is a good way to sort of segue into the show then. And I, I get the sense that many people here have seen at least one episode of Main Cabin Masters, but let's hope. Yeah. <laughs> but in your own words, do you just want to spend a little time saying like, what is the show about? How sure. How you describe it? Yeah. So Main Cabin Masters is a reality TV. They call it something else now, but it's a reality TV show that follows me, my brother-in-law, my sister, and two of our good friends growing up fixing up and renovating these camps and cabins all across the state. And a lot of these places are, you know, most contractors come in and say, tear it down, start fresh. But a lot of these places have family history that they don't want to lose. They're too close to the water where if they get torn down, you'd never be able to rebuild in the same spot. So that's when we come in and just, you know, fix these places up. We started in, do you know when we started? Uh, it was seven years ago. <laughs> Ten years. I mean, you're showing my poor research here. On you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are on our seventh build season. And when we first started, we were doing a pilot. And, you know, we thought we would have fun stories to tell. They were like, right from the start, this production company, Dorsey Pictures, was like, you know, don't get your hopes up. One pilot in a thousand gets picked up. Like, that's fine, you know, we just, we're having fun. We want to, you know, have cool stories to tell. Did this pilot, the Daggett Camp. Um, it was a eye-opening experience. And yeah, seven years later, here we are. Yeah, we've done over 100 episodes. And, you know, I think we did everything we weren't supposed to. We signed a contract on the hood of my truck in the <laughs> middle of November without reading it. <laughs> but luckily, it's worked out for the best. <laughs> Well, I want to go back in time a little bit sure, more because sure. I think about like knowing you, you are not the sort of person who seeks fame and fortune. No. So I know you're saying you wanted to do the pilot episode because it was sounded like a fun thing to do. But how did you even get to the point where you're going to do a sure, pilot sure, episode? Sure. Like, how does it even start? Yeah. So uh, my brother in law, Dixie Jedi, and I, we were all working together on a timber frame in Wayne. This opportunity kind of presented itself. My daughter's best friend's mother, <laughs> knew the production company out of Colorado, knew they were looking to do something in the state of Maine, said, hey, you guys should talk. So I uh, reached out, email, and like, is this real? And they're like, yes. <laughs> and then we did a few Skype interviews, and I think they liked the accents and the beards. And like I said, you know, then we did the pilot episode. Okay. And yeah, they showed up, I remember, you know, first day. Well, before that, I showed up on the job site middle of February, Guys were working. I'm like, hey, do you guys want to be on TV? <laughs> like, yeah, sure, just let's get back to work. You know, it was too cold to, to stop and talk. They're like, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm like, okay. So the first day the camera crew showed up, we were, none of us had any knowledge, ambition whatsoever. And it was just seven black SUVs. Everybody's in black. They have all this camera gear, all this stuff. And we're like, holy smokes. <laughs> 
but we got through it. It was definitely a learning experience. Um, yeah, and right from the start, they're like, so do you guys want to change or anything? I think they asked Ashley, they're like, so do you want to do your hair or makeup or anything? <laughs> and we're all like, no. <laughs> like, this, this is who we are. And I think that was what made it so easy mm -hmm. is because we were doing what we had always been doing. So you get to like choose your own outfits. Oh, yeah, yeah yes, like yes, yes. <laughs> Although I have to admit, they did buy this shirt for me one because they were sick of me just pulling shirts out of the back of my oh. truck. <laughs> Perks with the job. Yes, yes. So I do have to ask, since I teach courses in philosophy and spend a lot of time thinking about reality, and you're a reality TV star, how <laughs> real is the show? Is there, is, it, is there a script? Is it spontaneous? Is that something you're allowed to even disclose to an audience? <laughs> <laughs> We've teleprompter set up, yeah. reading us lines. No, so it, I mean, everything we say is what we say. Okay. And, you know, how they use it is kind of up to the production side of things. But luckily, the production team really got the beauty of the state of Maine and what we were doing. Because they could, they could have gone in many different directions. Yeah. But they, you know, they appreciated it. They made us look good. They made what we do look good. And yeah, it, um, when talking on film, you'd kind of have to like talk in the present and there's a certain way to speak so that you're not just falling into like different, you know, easy talk, I guess you'd call it. So the, our first interviews, like we would do interviews at the end of each day. And we would be sitting on this stump for two hours with these interviews, trying, you know, they were trying to coach us to get us to talk the right way. Oh. Yeah, which. Interesting. Yeah. And again, they didn't really know, the production side didn't know how to, the show was going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, they were kind of building the show at the same time. And so once they kind of figured it out, the, inter the interviews, their questions got easier. We kind of knew what they were looking for. So we'd be like, okay. You know, instead of saying they want to be like the camp owner on whatever pond we're working on is looking to do this, where it's like they want this, you know, oh. it's you got to be much more specific, specific. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. And when we first started, you know, there were cameras everywhere. We didn't know. Again, we didn't know what we were doing, what we'd gotten into. And I think with a uh, 142 hours of filming goes into each 42 minute episode, wow. which you know, when we were working, it's like, why are you doing this? Just let us work. <laughs> but once we finally saw an episode, we're like, oh, this makes sense. You know, they film from the back, they film from the front, and it has to look the same. And I mean, they have GoPro footage, they have drone footage. So it is quite a production to put the show together. Indeed. And I have to ask, because, you know, TV likes drama. Right. It does. And so do you ever have to sub dream up some kind of conflict beforehand? I don't know. Like <laughs> Working with my sister <laughs> dreams itself up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all organic. <laughs> yes. So again, when we first started out, they were kind of building the show mm -hmm. and they didn't really know what they were looking for. So they'd try and create this drama and that would be, you know, it would it was just so fake too manufactured. Yeah. And it just wasn't working and they were stopping us too much. And finally we're like, look, <laughs> leave us alone. And they left us alone and they, it just, it's just naturally going to happen. Right. You know, there's drama. Work, like I said, run out of nails. A generator's not going to work. Yeah. Like that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but they do have to do their act outs. Wait, what's and an act out? Can you an act out is that drama. We're like, Oh, is it going to happen? You'll find out after the commercial break. Oh, okay. Because they want to hook you. They want you coming back <laughs> after that commercial break. And so that's kind of just built into it. Um, the show is, they break it into seven acts. Okay. So, you know, there's first act where you kind of get the history of the camp, meet the camp owners, mm -hmm. and it goes through. Then you have commercial breaks between each one. And then the last seventh act is when you hand the camp back over to the family. And then there's like an arc to the plot. Yes. And, you know, then it's up to the film crew production team to kind of figure out what the storyline, what storylines are going to follow. Yeah. Because going into these camps, I mean, they, a lot of them are just run down They're, You know, some of them aren't habitable. And so we don't know what we're going to get into. So the production doesn't really know what to follow as well. So they'll follow maybe five different storylines and Whoa. maybe only two of them will actually carry through all the way. Yep. 
So that's, that's the whole power of editing when they come in and they, they kind of pick and choose what's going to make it into the episode. And so how involved the editing process are you? Or is that? Zero. Zero. <laughs> yeah. We don't see the episodes until they're done. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, you asked about reality. Is it real? I mean, we say what we want and, you know, we're mic'd up during the day. We, it's easy to forget your mic's on and, <laughs> you know, things get said. <laughs> And again, it's up to them to you pick and choose what they use. But again, Dorsey Pictures, they do a great job yeah. of that. So when we first started out, we were on the DIY network. And again, it was a small little show, Rinky Dink Main. And it, you know, it got picked up for a season and it was just amazing to see. First, we didn't even think we were gonna make it through a full season just because it was so much work. And working with a film crew, it just in the time frames, it was it was very difficult. We were up here for a little bit of it. Um, we've got a great crew working with us, luckily, so we got through it. And yeah, you just kind of go with it. Yeah. And you know, we got through season one. It's like, okay, what works, what doesn't, and just kind of build from there. It's so. That, I mean, this is a question I've been thinking about too. Is if you can say anything about you're on your seventh season now. Yes. So do you want to mention anything about like how the show has evolved? Like, has it just been a learning process or well, yeah, more popular now? So I imagine definitely, <laughs> definitely more popular. And again, you know, we started on DIY and then all of a sudden DIY is going away and merging with these other networks. And there was, you know, we weren't sure if we, we were going to be on another network, where we were going to be. Now we're on the Magnolia network. Okay. So it's great to finally have a home. It's a good fit. So you know, it's, we've, we've evolved that way where we, you know, we're a little bit more stable. It's mm -hmm. not quite so up in the air. Um, but again, I think with the production team kind of figuring out what works for them, they kind of get a, a, mo a model that they follow. Yep. And luckily, every camp is so different. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's kind of doing the same thing each time, but truly every camp is unique and has, you know, has a great family story or, you know, just starting a family story. And it's really fun to be able to be a part of that and save these places that, you know, might have just been torn down and a new place built in its, in its spot. So, that mean, this leads to this question for me is like, is there a cabin that you're most proud of or an episode that you are particularly fond of? It's been a lot of them. <laughs> there have been a lot of them. Um, one for me that really always stands out is Rob and Candy Eaton's camp. It, it, it was fun. And again, they were such a great... <laughs> such a great camp owners and i'll never forget it was a log cabin and just reaching my hand in and just pulling out handfuls of rotted wood and just squeezing it oh. and the water just dripping out and that i think that was like number four we had ever taken on might yeah you know fourth or fifth one we taken on it was on an island it was totally rotted out <laughs> and we're like what are we doing like <laughs> how are we ever going to make this work but again, we've got a great crew working with us. We figured it out and, you know, we truly did save that camp. And yeah. again, the camp owners were awesome. So awesome. Yeah. So there is like an element of suspense to the show, right? And the suspense I find when I'm watching it is you're getting ready to tear down like some old walls or you're doing demo on a ceiling and these camps are old. So you never quite know what's going to be behind that wall that comes crumbling down, or as you said, reaching your hand yeah. into the darkness. Have you, like maybe what's the most interesting thing you have found? Um, for me, the most interesting thing is seeing how they were built. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, most camps in Maine are, it's weekend warriors. You know, you want to go up to camp, you, the family grows, you need a little bit more space. So you bring up a load of materials and, you know, one day you'll frame up a deck come back in a month and just keep working on it. So it's always a work in progress. And you know, you're up to camp, you wanna be having fun. So you're swimming, boating, drinking. It's not really your priority to build these camps and you just build with what you have. So, I mean, we've seen some pretty crazy construction techniques. <laughs> Such as? We did one camp where it was two by six rafters on a, three or four pitch roof so it's about this much and they were about five foot on center spacing and the camp was still standing which it shouldn't have been <laughs> but again you know you go in and 
just say, okay, we got to change that or beef it up. And yeah, construction techniques are very interesting. We did one camp where they sheathed in their walls with old turnpike signs. So you know they were driving up from Massachusetts, saw a load of signs on the side of the highway. I was like, hey, we could use those, throw them in the truck and head north. And which is great, you know, I love it. And we yeah. try and do that as much as possible. And I think that's what draws a lot, you know, that's what keeps my interest is, you know, being able to reuse as much material as possible. Um, you know, if it, I tell everybody, if, if it still has life, keep using it. Yeah. Um, we use a lot of natural Eastern white pine, like this beautiful platform. <laughs> <laughs> And it's because that's what camps were originally built out of. You know, we're in a state that's so heavily forested. We are, we've got a logging industry that, you know, forestry products industry we want to help promote. So why not use these materials? And I personally enjoy working with real wood. Yeah. And again, it's, it's readily available. It's there. And that's also a way that helps keep down the budget. So I'm a scholar and I like quotes. <laughs> and I have a quote from the show, but I'm going to give a little history here. And um, this is that I remember one of my first impressions of you when we were COA students and everyone was getting to know each other as I thought, you know, this guy really likes going through garbage. <laughs> and, you know, I also quickly learned that garbage is a very subjective concept. And I also think you were the first person to acquaint me with the practice of dumpster diving. <laughs> All right. So that can't be true. <laughs> And I was watching the um, most recent season, season seven, in A New Cabin Legacy. And around minute 11, Jedi, who's on the show, is looking out of a second story window. And he's watching you sort through this huge like construction pile of debris. And he says, we are witnessing Chase, quote, in his wild salvation stage. <laughs> <laughs> and you're obviously sorting this garbage or yeah. debris into different piles. So oh. I'm wondering if you can talk about the process <laughs> of salvaging when you're looking at a pile of what I would see as trash, but you're clearly seeing potential or is it artistic? Is it intuitive? Do you think? Maybe we should have my wife come up and uh, feel this one. <laughs> Cause she has to look out at it across the street from our house. I've got my barn and there's so much material there, <laughs> but that's just it. Like again, with old boards, like, you know, say you pull some wall boards off the exterior of a camp and they're weathered in the gray, those still have life. You can bring them inside, use them as an accent wall, um, you know, make frames, make pieces of furniture, uh, you know, old toilets. Again, you know, <laughs> for some, some of these camps we're working on, a toilet is an upgrade and, <laughs> and I have no problem pulling a toilet. I actually have a couple, like I said, a couple sitting across the street from my house currently pulling a camp from a toilet from one camp and putting it in another one. I mean, mostly it's windows and stuff like that, but you know, we do have a, I do have a composting toilet that we salvaged. Mm -hmm. It's sitting in one of my barns and you know, we'll use, we will use it, but until it's, we're ready for it, it sits there and you know, things stockpile. Um, and yeah, I, again, that was bred into me at an early age. My grandparents were this way. And I think it's just the main way frugality yeah. and, you know, don't waste, not, you know, want not it's yeah. And I, I believe in it. And I think most of the guys are coming around to that. <laughs> it's starting to get a little hard when they're all picking the same piles as me. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I get first pick here. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a hierarchy of on course, the show. Of course. Of the garb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe we could talk a few minutes, and I want to make sure we leave time for questions. But, you know, your show has been really, really popular. And I have one more quote here. This comes from BuddyTV.com. <laughs> which says, quote, soon after its debut on network television, the talented family behind main cabin masters quickly took the spot of the highest rated reality TV series on the DIY network. It was number one on the DIY network in the US during the run of its first three seasons. And season three of main cabin masters attracted over 3.5 million fans wow. since its premiere alone. Obviously you've done several seasons since that the time of the quote. And I just want to know, do you want to say something about why you think the show has been so popular? Do you think it's connected to what you were just talking about in terms of sort of salvaging and thinking about repurposing? Are there other reasons you think the show has been? I think there's a lot of reasons why it's yeah. so popular. Um, and again, it would, we wouldn't be where we are without the crew we have working with us. 
So, uh, so now, you know, it started out just the six of us. And again, we didn't think we'd make it through the first year. We're up to about 20 carpenters during the height of the summer. So right now I've got, actually all the guys are working right now. So I feel a little bit guilty. <laughs> <laughs> But we've got four, pro four to five projects going at a time. And yeah, we've got a great team working with us. So I think we're able to you know, get these camps done in a quick amount of time. It really is eight to 12 weeks that we're getting these camps completed. So we have to be fast, we have to be smart. And we're all experienced carpenters. What, you know, we've got great skill levels, but the guys, the crew need to learn, like there's a balance between, you know, fine woodworking and cabin building. You know, you have to be able to get it done fast. Don't worry about eighths or sixteenths of an inch. Mm -hmm. And you know, if it has a few knots, that's fine. We tell camp owners always it's just a camp. You know, it's going to be a camp. We want you to use it. We want you to enjoy it. And we want you to, you know, beat it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, but that's also how we're able to keep the budget so low. Yeah. Because budget, budget questions always come up, like without a doubt. Um, we do work with low budgets. Yep. But, you know, by not worrying about the finish as much, repurposing material, and a big thing that helps keep the budget down is not having the camp owners right there telling us what to do and exactly <laughs> what they want. It makes a big difference. Yeah. And so I think, and yeah, so it's the low budget, um, the beauty of the state, yeah. you know, repurposing, reusing materials, and yeah, I think, and also just the connection to Maine. Like so many people have a connection to the state, whether they went to summer camp here or have, you know, came to Bar Harbor every summer as a kid or just want to come to the state. It just has this appeal that I think drew people into the show, especially during the pandemic as well. Yeah. Um, it was we were fortunate to be able to keep filming during the pandemic because we were so isolated. Mm -hmm. Most production companies had to shut down, but we, you know, on a typical film shoot, there's eight to 12 production team members from the sound guy, the cameraman, to the producer, to the assistant producer. During the pandemic, we did a couple of reveals with one cameraman. Oh, like that was it. He would set up cameras and you know, put them on tripods, get everything set up. And Ashley and I would walk into the camp, you know, be like, this is what we did. We would walk out, leave the, leave the keys on the counter. And then the homeowners would walk in and do it too. You know? Oh, wow. So, I mean, there were tricks to it, but we were able to keep going, yep. which I think helped, you know, at the time, you know, people needed something at, as an escape. Like, I don't know how many times we heard it, you know, when we, thank you, thank you, thank you. We were trapped in our house during the pandemic, but you brought Maine to us, yeah. which, I mean, that's a huge honor right there. And I think we're all appreciative of I mean, that. And that's one of the things I love about the show is seeing, you know, settings in Maine that I recognize. Yeah. Yes. Being like, oh, yes. I've been on that lake yeah. or yeah, I recognize that mountain. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's always really interesting to see something on TV that you've also seen in this dimension. Yes. And it also, you know, I've noticed in hanging out with you, it's interesting that now you have a certain celebrity status. <laughs> so, I wonder if you want to talk at all about like what's it like being a TV celebrity? Has it changed the way you act in public? Are you more self-conscious? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say no, you don't seem like you've changed, but do you want to talk about that element of what it's like? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think my kids do a very good job of keeping it real for me. Mm -hmm. They, uh, I've got four, well, four kids, teenagers down to 10 years old and nothing like a teenager to really uh, put you in your place. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been great to watch the kids grow up with a show. Mm -hmm. You know, when we first started out, my son Fletcher was, you know, this little kid with a blonde mullet. And now he's, <laughs> you know, still a little kid with long blonde hair, but it's just amazing. And I, I, it's fortunate to uh, have that documented on TV and to actually have family be around us because you know we're working in the summertime. Yep. So I I don't know. I I like to think I haven't changed, but <laughs> ask my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could spend a few minutes as I'm keeping an eye on the time here, thinking about the process of renovation. And I'm just curious, how do you actually decide which cabins 
to renovate? I imagine people are requesting, yep. you know, the cabin masters to come in all the time. Is there ever issues where you see a cabin and you're like, oh, this cabin is beyond like repair. There's a red flag. Like, how do you make those sorts of decisions about what cabins to work with? So season one, we had to beg, borrow and plead for cabins because we were like, hey, we want to fix your cabin up for this reality show, but you can't be there. <laughs> like, <laughs> nobody was like, oh, here's the keys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the process is, you know, we go and pre-scout the camps. Well, we have an application, maincabinmasters.com. People submit their cabin. We go look at it and say, okay, can we realistically get this work done in eight to, eight to 12 weeks? And is there enough of a transformation so it's not just all replacing rotted sills that you'll never see. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be that TV factor. There's got to be a good story to it. Mm -hmm. it's got, there's got to be that transformation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we're fortunate now where we have enough applications, we can kind of group them together. Um, we previously, we were never able to take on like really bad projects, like a complete teardown, just because we we're still so new, the network wasn't sure about it. But now that we're with Magnolia, we have a little bit more comfort. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to take on a few projects where they are a complete teardown and a new construction. And the crews definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, starting with everything on a nice level playing field, you know, things go quick and yeah. What's like your biggest adversary? I, mean, I know rot, like rotten wood seems rot, to be rot, like rot, a major rot, theme. Rot, in rot, the... rot. Yep. <laughs> are there other obstacles when you're renovating in Maine that you feel like are a recurring problem? Yeah, location. Mm -hmm. You know, we, again, we try and group them together, but some, you know, we're doing one right now up in the Alder Stream Township. So getting materials up there, you know, running off generators, that type of stuff. That's always a challenge. Weather's a challenge. Yeah. Um, working in winter is never fun. They say that the worse it is for us, the better TV it is, but <laughs> <laughs> it's... it's yeah, you know, working in the middle of February when tools are freezing, your hands are freezing. It's like, why? Why are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs> what about black bears? Have you ever had any problems with black bears breaking we've, in? <laughs> no, we've never had any trouble with black bears. We've never had, luckily, we don't have poisonous, pre like, I don't think I could do this show down in Florida somewhere where, you know, you reach your arm under a camp. Yeah. And there could be a snake or spider. It's like, no, thank you. you what know? about like hornets or wasps or bees nests? <laughs> I seem to have bad luck with hornets wherever I go. <laughs> I just got stung two days ago, right between the eyes. And yeah, two days ago, my whole face was swollen up. I could barely see out of my eyes. So I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> I was going to have to wear sunglasses all day today, but <laughs> swelling has gone down. Um, carpenter ants, we deal with a lot. Yep. We just did a camp where we were jacking it up and we we're pulling off the skirting around the camp. And I saw something under there. So I turned my flashlight on, looked in there and there was this Fisher cat <gasps> curled up just staring at me, Oh! but it was dead. Oh. Yeah. So it had must have crawled in there at, I don't know, in the middle of winter, curled up in a ball Aww. and just, you know, died from cold weather or whatever, but it was perfectly preserved. It still had skin and whiskers on its face, but it was just like looking right. I mean, it was freaky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we set that aside. We'll put it back in the camp when we're done. Is that going to be in an episode? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> that seems for a good TV drama right, right, right there. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, has like anything really dangerous ever happened on the show? Has anyone been injured? And I mean, yeah. Why would you bring that up? I, I just I mean, this seems like one of the episodes I was watching last week. They were like a couple of the guys were tearing down a huge old furnace down these like stairs that were covered in ice, and I was like, oh my gosh, that is so. Like we've, we've again we've been very fortunate i worry about ryan all the time when he's doing demo <laughs> he just gets so fired up and when he's running through walls and stuff he's had a few close calls yeah he's gone through ceilings he's almost electrocuted himself so yeah it's but for the most part we try and do everything as safely yeah. as possible um you know when the film crews around we definitely do you know we do some things that we wouldn't necessarily do like if we weren't on TV, yeah. you know, <laughs> pulling the porch off a dock with a deck with a boat, you know, that type of stuff. Um, dropping a tree on a camp, which actually, you know, did help, but you know, <laughs> certain Can stuff. Can you say a little more about why that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're fortunate that we're able to have fun with it. Um, yeah. And again, we, you know, we're in a unique situation where we're taking this camp it, there's a huge level of trust because camp owners are giving us the keys. They're walking away. 
allowing us to do what we can to their camp and then you know give it back to them but we also then have to make the camp, the camp camera ready mm -hmm. so it's not just put the floors down finish everything off and go it's like okay then we need to get ashley's team in there decorate we've got landscaping that needs to be done so ashley has a team that works with her we've got a okay. landscaping team that comes in they've got to set dress it all this stuff and then film the reveal so it, you know there's a lot that goes into it yeah, I mean, that's one thing I really like about the show is how I guess it's usually Ashley is working with different you know, local artists yep. and craftspeople. Yep. Yep. So how do you make those sorts of connections? I know you, your family knows lots of people in yep. the state, but that, that part of the show is always really interesting. So how does that? Well, that's how it all started. You know, we just kind of pull on family and friends, be like, mm -hmm. hey, Aunt Glow, can we come over and uh, <laughs> invade your space and do a cool project? And she's like, sure. Yeah. And now, you know, once people have seen the show, you know, we have artisans that reach out, Ashley keeps reaching out to people. Um, we feature a lot of them at our store down in Manchester, which is nice. Yep. You know, we worked with Wayne Village Pottery, some good friends of ours, and Ashley went and made loon whistles. And after the episode aired, they couldn't make loon whistles fast enough. Oh, wow. Like it was just constant, constant, constant. And, you know, they'd catch up and then on the show would rerun air and the list would just build right back up. <laughs> But you know, it was great that you know it was all this business and promotion that they got. So it's it's nice to be able to help, you know, bring everybody up together. Yeah. I think is how we've always kind of looked at it. So, so if you want your loon whistle, put your order in early. Can you do the loon call? I can. Can you? No. <laughs> I need a loon whistle. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. That was a lucky first try. <laughs> So, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, at COA, we have all these discussions about sustainability, yep. obviously, of your roots yep. here. Um, if somebody is currently renovating a cabin or a home, what do you think is the most important renovation they could do in terms of energy efficiency or? Energy efficiency? Um, is that something you, th like, um, is that something that comes up on the show? Is it does occasionally. Like, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll do like a, a winter cabin yeah. where they want to use it for skiing or winter recreation. So we'll have to put in insulation. But it's amazing, you know, everybody says they want a four season camp. Yeah. Like, you know, what's your first? Well, I'd love to be able to use this camp four season. It's like, well, do you really? Because January is in Maine can be pretty hard. And, you know, it sounds great, but if you can't get to your camp regularly or if you, you know, you're not there all the time, yeah. if your water lines freeze or something like that, you know, there's a lot to think about. But, you know, typically three seasons is an ideal situation. And it's amazing how much newer windows and just buttoning it up so you don't get a draft. Mm -hmm. I mean, insulation's always nice, but you know, some situations you don't want insulation, whereas just, again, good windows, tightening it up, it'll be able to hold the heat. And you don't have that wind going through your camp kind of drawing the heat away. What's your favorite kind of heat source for a camp, or does it depend? <laughs> I think it's always wood stove. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of work, yeah. and it's nice. It's a, you can't beat the heat. But again, that you know, they take up a lot of space. They're heavy. Mm -hmm. They're not always the safest. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and we do camps off the grid. On, we're doing two right now off the grid, and you know, we're looking at small solar setups. Uh, people, again, it's more just making it comfortable. Yeah. People want, you know, a bathroom close by. They want a little bit of power for a light or two to be able to charge a phone or mm -hmm. you know a flashlight or something like that, which, you know, is reasonable. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. I have one hypothetical question here, <laughs> and then we can open it up to the audience. But say you are stranded indefinitely on a deserted island that is covered with dilapidated cabins. There is what? no power. <laughs> what three tools do you bring? Hammer. Mm -hmm. And why? Because <laughs> the hammer is good for everything. All right. What can I have power? Let's do it first without power. I want what about cordless power? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> stretching the game, sure. Fine. Okay. Hammer, saw, and yeah. Hammer, saw, and nails. nails. No, I, th I think hammer and saw. You can pretty much do what you need with a hammer and saw. Yeah. All right. Now, if I could have a Dewalt Impact cordless brushless screwdriver, okay. <laughs> that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just ask one more question and then I'll open it up. But um, do you want to... <laughs> one more, one more. 
but I think it's an important one. I want to make sure we get to it. Do you just want to talk a little bit about like your passion for renovation, where that has come from? I think you mentioned it a little bit at the beginning, but. Yeah, I think, it, again, it's all just loving where we are, mm -hmm. loving what we do, um, you know, learning it from family. And I think that's an important thing. I'd like to be able to pass on these skills because it's something, you know, there's thousands of carpentry crews out there doing exactly what we're doing. We just happen to have a film crew following us around. Um, we've started getting some younger kids working with us and it's fantastic. You know, some of the older guys were like, you know, not really into it because these kids show up and they know nothing and they're a little frustrated. But then, you know, once they can say, hey, bring me that pile of lumber and they don't have to go down, you know, lug it all themselves. They're like, oh, this isn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, these are skills that anybody can do. Yeah. And it's great to be able to teach these skills to young kids where you know they're going to have them for the rest of their lives and it, they can easily fall back into it exactly how we did. Like, none of us set out to be on TV. None of us might have necessarily planned to be carpenters, but it's a great profession. It's fun work. It's hard work, but it's rewarding work. Great. No. All right. This is, I still have a whole other book, like list of questions, but I'm going to stop <laughs> and see if other people want to jump in on the discussion. All right. And if everyone could just speak right into the mic, that'd be great. Hi, Chase. Hi. Um, we're obviously big groupies. Um, been to your store, got a shirt. Fantastic. Yep. Um, Come back. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for doing this, coming here. Uh, love to hear the story. Uh, so my question, I think I asked you a little bit, but uh, part of the success of, of the show and what we enjoy is kind of the family dynamics working together and how you guys, you know, feed and, and challenge each other. Um, can you, in seven years, I mean, can you talk about kind of how the relationship's working and whether it's enhanced the family dynamics or is it a challenge or, you know, just... <laughs> you want <laughs> currently? Because <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's... Family is so important to all of us. Like, without a doubt, I mean, to be able to have my kids on site, um, be able to work with my brother-in-law, I guess, honestly, to be able to work my, with my sister, I'm pretty fortunate, I'll admit it. Um, we fight, but at the end of the day, we all come back together, um, you know, and we'll you know, sit around and have a beer together. When we're working, we'll, when we're on the job site, you know, we'll bounce ideas off each other, and you know nobody knows it all so it's kind of fun to be able to have that relationship but i think if anything we our family's grown even bigger you know because we brought in all these great carpenters working with us ashley's team you know even the film crew is you know they're they're family now they've been with us for seven years you know they're starting to bring their families out here to vacation so it's you know it's in staying some of the cabins that we've worked in so it's it's nice to see how our show has grown, but also how our family and community has grown. Great. No, thanks. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, at the start of the show, the family always says how much they're willing to put into the project, which often seems like a fairly modest amount. At least I'm saying that's what are they going to do with that? And then a miracle unfolds. <laughs> uh, so my question is, is there any source of funding either uh, when you look at the project as a whole, the, the, from the uh, furnishings and the landscaping, let alone the construction? Is there any source of funding that comes in, sponsor donations or anything other than what the family puts in? Yes. So what you see on the show is what the camp owner puts into the project. Um, there's gotta be an incentive to be on the show because again, we, we take the keys, we say, we're gonna do this for you. You can't, I mean, we, the homeowners have input, but they're not able to show up on site and take a look until the process is complete. Um, any savings that we get, whether company wants to promote a product or has material to donate, we pass those savings on to the camp owners. Uh, Ashley has a design budget for her piece of it. Uh, she tries to pull in as much furniture and furnishings from the camp owners as possible to mix in. But we try and save on that budget any way we can. In fact, you know, windows are biggie. Um, Ryan, I was talking to Ryan this morning, and he was taking a load of windows we've pulled out of Camp Sunshine 
that they were, you know, we went down and helped replace all these windows for them, and they were throwing out the old windows, and I, I, I couldn't let them go. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped my barn full of them, and now we're bringing those, camp, those windows up to, you know, they're perfect for camp. They weren't good for what Camp Sunshine was doing. So again, any, any cost savings we have, we pass on to the camp owners. Um, the, unfortunately, the days of the $15,000 to $20,000 budgets are just, you know, they're gone. Uh, we can take on some smaller projects with that size, but yeah, it's a tough, you know, prices have gone up mm -hmm. and lead times have gone up. You know, we can't, we have to be able to have material on site ready to go. So we can't, well, it kind of works. It benefits us both ways. We're not able to order custom sized windows, but we can walk into local lumberyard and say, hey, what do you have for misordered or missized windows? And we'll say, great, we'll take them and we'll make them work in the camp however we can. And that, that saves a lot of money on the budget as well. Sure. I think Millard has a question. <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on, Millard. No, no, this needs to be recorded for posterity and for the virtual audience. Great. First of all, it's great to see you. You as well. So, so, yeah, so great. <laughs> um, I have a question about the, about the, in a normal building project, there is a, there is a programming phase and, it, and you're, you explain, and if I missed that, I'm sorry, I was 10 minutes late, but if I missed that, I apologize. But what, what, and what role does the client pl play before they hand you the keys? Is there any programming whatsoever in that, before that? Yes, uh, th thank yeah, you. for sure. Um, it's great to see you. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll meet with camp owners, we'll go to their camps, and we just kind of say, what, what do you wish for? Like, what do you want to see done? And so we get a good sense of what their needs are, what they're looking for, and what they would love to have. And then we kind of come up with a realistic budget, what they can afford, and we try and get as much done as we can within that budget. So, you know, a good example is we use so much Eastern white pine, we'll buy units of it, drop it off, and we'll use it for everything. And some, you know, if the budget allows, we'll polyurethane it and finish it off. If the budget doesn't allow it, they get unfinished pine and they can, you know, do it down the road, or we'll leave it framed, finish, but we try and get it done as much as they want. And then we try and do some of those wish list items that they wouldn't necessarily get, you know, projects that Ash, special projects Ashley does, or, you know, fun, creative projects I get to do, you know, stuff that normally we wouldn't tackle. Yeah. And we do have some homeowners. We do talk to homeowners during the whole process. Again, they're just not allowed to show up on the job site. It, it, it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question up here. Hi, Chase. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming today. Thank you. Uh, so, so just to, for full disclosure, we're on your long list of applicants. All right, We've right. acquired a camp <laughs> that need, needs help. But listening to you, uh, I guess kind of two parts. Uh, you you talked about how you've you've expanded your operation. So part one is 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 are you working on camps that that then aren't selected for the t to be selected for the TV show, and also have you started giving thought to what's what's life for cabin masters when the TV show has has run its course? Oh. So currently, like I said, currently we're doing four projects. We're on four projects. We're getting our next four lined up. Um, before the pandemic, we were almost to a point where we could take on some outside projects. You know, things were starting to flow well. We're trying to get back to that point, take on some outside projects. You know, we're, real, we're limited to the size of the projects we can take on. So, and again, they aren't the highest budgeted projects. So it would be nice to get some longer term projects where, you know, in the winter time, we've got them closed in, they're ready for everybody to work inside. So it isn't quite as, you know, brutal on, on us. Um, I don't get to swing a hammer as often as I like anymore. There's a lot to keeping everything going, which, you know, some days when I show up on the job site and I can just, you know, work all day, leave my phone in the truck, it's, you know, some of the best days I get. But, you know, unfortunately, Ryan and I are constantly running around making sure everybody has materials and stuff. And this is the height of our season. We don't really have time to kind of think about the future. We probably should a little bit more, but I think that's kind of why we set up the retail space 
in our headquarters. So again, we have kind of a home base where we can, something that's gonna carry on. We know the show isn't gonna last forever. We're gonna have fun with it as long as we can, but yeah, I think you know most of us will go back. I mean, my ideal situation would be working on a cabin off the grid, middle of nowhere, by myself, with me making all the decisions, <laughs> not having to say anything about what I'm doing, explaining it. So someday that will come. <laughs> oh. All right, right up here. Hi, I'm, I'm, this has been wonderful. It's been fascinating. And I'm not a fan of your show because I don't have television. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this. There you go. YouTube. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> I, and I'm also not from Maine. So um, out of ignorance, how, how much does, you're in a lot of different counties and locations. How does um, permitting oh, um, mm. play a role in how quickly and how you can proceed? That is a very good question. Permitting plays a huge role in how we choose camps. Um, we're at the point now where we've realized every town in Maine is different. We think we have it figured out. We're like, okay, we're on it. And we go into the next town, submit everything. They're like, that's not how we do it. We're like, you know, and we're not trying to, we've learned we have to be upfront, you know, get our permanent seating lined up right away. Uh, year one, we kind of just operated as we normally had and got away with it. Year two, we uh, definitely didn't get away with anything. And people were saying, nope, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And again, it was, you know, we didn't know. We just, it was a learning experience. So now we tell people, you know, if you want, if you want to apply for the show, get your permits lined up mm. because, you know, people would say, you know, I want to put a deck on the front of my camp and the camp already is five feet from water's edge. We're like, you know, if you get the permits, we'll do it. But we, you know, we know how difficult it can be. So permits definitely play an issue. And again, you know, I struggle with permits, but I know, you know, I, I struggle with zoning, all that, but I know why it's there. It's to protect the water quality. It's to protect the natural beauty. It's just, it is always challenging. Sure. That's a good answer. <laughs> Yeah, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep. So, so this may be more of a, of a comment than a question, but, but one of the things that I, I noticed that you do is you, you get the community involved in, in some of these builds and, and you're, you're giving back to the community. You get people to donate and you're, whether you're building a building for a, a YMCA uh, playground or you're making a, um, upgrading a, a facility for wounded warriors for making it um, uh, handicap accessible, you know, but but getting everybody involved it's not it's more than just helping out a, a, a particular owner of a property it's really much more than that and i, I just want to applaud you for doing that because i think it's awesome that you're, you're um, making the community better and helping kids and, and people that are disadvantaged well thank you very much <laughs> thank you yeah. yeah i think again you know we realize how fortunate we are and you know, we want to try and give back as much as we can. And, you know, we live in the state. We're not going to leave the state. We want to be here. We're going to be here long after the film crew's gone doing what we do. So we want to make sure we're doing things right and we're, you know, making things better. Yeah. One funny story is season one, we, the, we did a camp over on the other side of Frenchman's Bay. This kind of shows the disconnect between production. They showed up for the arrival and they had two um, side by sides. And so, you know, we were ripping up and down the camp road and the producer, the executive producer was like, okay, now I want you to fly onto that shoreline and rip up and back on the shoreline, you know, mid tide. So it was like over all this. And we we're like, no, we're not doing this. Like, yep, yeah, you got to do, you know, because we were so new to it, you know, we couldn't really say no to him, but we're like, absolutely not. Like, we're not going to go out ripping around because out West you can, you know, ride around on the beaches and stuff in your vehicles. Mm. But I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, if you want to survive in this state, there's some things you have to trust us on. And luckily, we were able to talk them down, and we just, you know, filmed on the camp road. But, no. Great. 
Well, thank you so much, Chase, for coming and talking about this with all of us. And thank you, everyone, for coming out yeah, today. Yeah, thank it's you, everybody, really for turning great. out today, and I appreciate right. it. Thank you. <laughs>